All right, so now that we have established our computation definition of the dot product, and we have also established some algebraic properties of the dot product, we are officially ready for the geometric interpretation of the dot product. And again, this geometric interpretation allows us to determine the angle between two vectors. So here we go. Given two non-zero vectors, say vector u and vector v, in R2 or R3, their dot product is defined as follows. So we have the dot product of vector u dotted with vector v is equal to the magnitude of vector u multiplied by the magnitude of vector v multiplied by cosine of theta. And now this is where theta is the angle between the vectors. So this is the angle between vector u and vector v. So if we wanted to think about this graphically, you could say here is some vector u and here is some vector v. They have to have that same initial point and we are trying to find that angle in between. So there is our theta, the angle in between vector u and vector v. And this is such that theta must be greater than or equal to zero, less than or equal to pi. And now one other little note here before we go through this derivation is that if vector u is equal to the zero vector, or if vector v is equal to the zero vector, then of course we now know from our algebraic properties that the dot product of those two vectors is zero thus implying that theta is undefined. And so again, if vector u is equal to the zero vector, or if vector v is equal to the zero vector, then of course we know that vector u dot vector v is going to be equal to zero. And in this case, the angle theta is undefined. So let's go ahead now and look at where this comes from. We need to establish equivalence. So let's derive the geometric interpretation of the dot product. All right, here we go. We need to verify that the computation definition of the dot product and the geometric definition of the dot product are in fact equal. So in order to do this, I want to begin by considering a graph of this description in the xy plane. So here we go. Let's say that we have, here's our beautiful vector u in the xy plane. And we'll put vector v right here. And we of course know that angle theta is between these two vectors. So in order to verify equivalence here, we need to create a triangle using our two vectors u and v. So let's think about this triangle outside of the xy plane. So here we go. So we know that this side here comes from vector u. So it's going to have a side length of the magnitude of vector u. And this side on the bottom here is coming from vector v. So its side length is going to be the magnitude of vector v. But what is this side length here? So in order to determine that missing side length, let's go back to the xy plane and create ourselves a parallelogram. So I'm going to take this side length and put it from the origin to create that parallelogram. All right, so here is our beautiful parallelogram. And we have these two side lengths, or those two vectors are equivalent. So what is that vector? Well, by the parallelogram rule, we can see that from the terminal point of vector v, that we have a vector here, and I'll use a different color, that's parallel to vector u, but pointing in the opposite direction. So the missing side length is related to the vector v minus u. So this is our vector v minus u. And the missing side length 
is the magnitude of vector v minus vector u. And we should also incorporate here that this is our angle theta. So we now need to establish a formula that relates the side lengths of this triangle. And fortunately, we have a formula that relates the side lengths of a non-right triangle. So let's recall here the law of cosines. So we'll consider some non-right triangle with side lengths A, B, and C. And we'll indicate angle B here to kind of match our triangle from above. So angle B is associated, well angle little b is associated with side length B. And the law of cosines tells us that side length B squared is equal to side length A squared plus side length C squared minus 2 times side length A times side length C multiplied by the cosine of little b. So we're going to use this formula, this law of cosines, with our triangle drawn above to help us establish equivalence between the computation definition and the geometric definition. So again, looking at our picture here, we can see that theta is associated with the side length magnitude of vector v minus vector u. So we can say by the law of cosines, we have the following. We can say that the magnitude of vector v minus vector u squared is equal to the magnitude of vector u squared plus the magnitude of vector v squared minus 2 times the magnitude of vector u multiplied by the magnitude of vector v multiplied by cosine of theta. So now the right-hand side cannot be simplified any further, but looking at our left-hand side here, we recognize that we can apply one of the algebraic properties of the dot product to help us simplify or to help us rewrite this. So we can say by the algebraic properties of the dot product, So we're using property number two of those algebraic properties. So remember, we looked at the proof for this. We saw that the magnitude of vector u squared is equal to the dot product of that vector with itself. So let's apply this property to the magnitude of vector v minus vector u squared. So the magnitude of vector v minus vector u squared is equal to the dot product of vector v minus vector u with itself. And now foiling this out, we have the following. So foiling this out leaves us with vector v dot vector v minus 2 times vector u dot vector v plus vector u dotted with vector u. And we can apply that same algebraic property to the first and last terms and rewrite this as the magnitude of vector v squared minus 2 times the, oops, shame on me, that's minus 2 times vector u dot vector v plus the magnitude of vector u squared. So we have established two different formulas here for the magnitude of vector v minus vector u squared. We have the formula established from the law of cosines, and we now have the formula established from the algebraic properties of the dot product. So we can equate these. And we can say that since the magnitude of vector v minus vector u squared is equal to the magnitude of vector v minus vector u squared, or simply by saying, by equating these two equations, we have the following. So we have the magnitude of vector v squared minus 2 times vector u dotted with vector v plus the magnitude of vector u squared is equal to the magnitude of vector u squared plus the magnitude of vector v squared minus 2 
times the magnitude of vector u times the magnitude of vector v multiplied by cosine of theta. Whew! But look at all this beautiful simplification that we have. We can subtract the magnitude of vector v squared from both sides of the equation. And those two terms cancel each other right out on both sides. We can do the same thing with the magnitude of vector u squared. When we subtract this from both sides of the equation, they cancel each other out completely. So this leaves us now with negative 2 times the dot product of vector u with vector v is equal to negative 2 multiplied by the magnitude of vector u times the magnitude of vector v multiplied by cosine of theta and dividing both sides now by negative 2. We see what we wanted. Woohoo! We see that vector u dot vector v is in fact equivalent to the magnitude of vector u multiplied by the magnitude of vector v multiplied by cosine of theta. Hooray! And now keep in mind too, since this derivation came from a triangle, and we know that the sum of all the angles in a triangle must be 180 degrees or pi radians, we have confirmed the bounds. So we've confirmed that theta must be greater than or equal to zero, less than or equal to pi.